Craig Peterson. I was the band's manager and one of the writers um, of lyrics and did most of their audio work and engineering and whatever had to be done. <laughs> How old were you when you started with music, lyric writing, bands? Well, I started in music when I was about eight. Took accordion lessons for two or three years. And then I started playing trombone in an elementary school band. And then as I got older, I couldn't get, when I moved to California, I couldn't get accordion lessons anymore. Mm -hmm. And I thought about going to keyboards, and I didn't. I should have. I was crazy not to. <laughs> but uh, I got into doing the behind the scenes work. I got started out managing bands and that was right during the when the Beatles were first out huge, okay. And I found we had several bands close by so I started working with them. And uh, several people out of those bands did real well, got very well known. But uh, I came up to the Bay Area specifically to work with bands. I, when I was in college, I did all of the organizing for all of the gigs that were done for the college because I was head of public relations for the student body. And that got me going with a band called The Vegetables who told me, if you want to work in music, you got to go to San Francisco. So that's when I went to San Francisco and I met with the the guys that made up Pendragon probably within three months of getting to the area in 1969. So 1969, that would be right around when Derek French came back, right? Uh, yeah, when Derek had been in the Army, uh, he got back on a leave because he was coming back. I got to meet him, but by the time he actually got back, I had already been drafted. Mm -hmm. So I was gone about nine months and came back and he was still with the band. They, they were living at the Atherton Band House then. Let's see what I should ask next. So you just said that. When did you really feel like you had become the band's manager? Was it right when you came back? Well, you know, it was interesting because the first night I met the band was uh, Bruce took me to a practice on Friday night, which started at midnight. We practiced until like 7 in the morning at a gun range, okay. <laughs> and we would go in and do this. And afterwards, I stopped and talked to the guys and told them I was interested in what they were doing because they had some really, some really good stuff going on. It wasn't tied together yet, but it was there. And... So I had a conversation with them, and it was kind of interesting because our drummer, George, said, well, what the hell can you do for us? <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is always a classic question on that. And, you know, the thing of it is, is that my experience with the music was more on that end of it, setting up bookings and getting gigs and dealing with the bands and so on, which is what I covered with him. But I told him, I said, you know, you guys are great, but... You know, whenever you make a little mistake, you stop and you got to quit doing that and you're doing this and you're doing that and you really need to tape everything so you can hear what you sound like. And so that night, Mark and Martin and I went out to a movie and and uh, within a week I was the manager of the band. And I felt like I was the manager of the band. It was accepted by everybody. So. so it sounds like it was a pretty quick transition. You guys it was. It was a very quick transition. But I've worked with enough good bands to know when I heard a good band, you know. Hear that with your pan dragon? You have been approved. They never really realized how good they were. Do you think they do now? I think they do now, but I don't think they did until they saw those critical reviews. You mean just recently, the ones oh, that yeah. have been flooding in? They, they, I, I don't think they ever had an idea of how good they really were. And you had just mentioned that when you first met them, you told them that you said that they should record, and the album, the three LP album, is made up of 
over 200 recordings that you parsed down. 200 tapes. 200 tapes! So, this is way more than 200 recordings. Oh, 200 yeah. tapes. 200 tapes. And so, were you the reason that they started doing all of those recordings? I was the reason they started doing that. And when we first started doing that, we didn't have any recording equipment. This guy I knew had a Roberts Akai recorder that had been in his trunk in a car accident and he had taken it apart trying to fix it and couldn't fix it. So I took this broken tape recorder and I fixed it and made it work and that's what we started recording with. Mm -hmm. And we did lots of tapes on that. In fact, several of the songs on this were done on that machine. Uh, eventually we bought a Sony uh, 4 channel that we imported from uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. And that was when we were getting ready to open the studio. The problem we had with it was, was that they had a longshoreman strike. And when our recorder arrived, it sat on the boat for six and a half months. Oh no. <laughs> we had to wait for the, for the strike to be over so we could get our recorder okay. And a lot of the rest of the material, other than the stuff that was done in Pacific recording and action recording, mm -hmm. was done on those machines. We used the Akai, uh, Roberts, you know, Radio Shack, and, and then the Sony Pork Track. Yes. All right. All with mixers, no soundboards, too. Critics have noticed that the musical history of the band mm -hmm. is reflected in the three album LP. Was that done purposefully or did it just sort of... It just, it just sort of came out that way because the guys were always aware of what was going on around them. And they tried to incorporate things in that they heard that they liked. Uh, you know, the Beatles at that time were huge. They were the big band. And one of the things that we noticed about the Beatles that was different than a lot of other bands is, is that every song they did was different than the last one. There wasn't any similarities at all. So that's what we strive to do, is to write every song so that it sounded different than the last one. And I think it all comes out in these recordings. It's, it does. A... It's all there. And to be honest, these recordings were just like, you know, when you're a photographer, you take pictures. If you want one or two good pictures, you take 30. So you know you're getting the one you want. Recording's the same way. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same way. There was many of those recordings that we could have done nothing with. Nothing. Mm -hmm. But God, there were some that were just jewels. And now we have them. And now we have them. And Immortalized. Ah. But you know, it's it's one of those things that we weren't conscious that that was going to be a potential outcome. We were just doing it so the guys could hear what they sounded like. Mm -hmm. so when you play in a band, you don't know what it sounds like to the guy out front. Thank you only know what it sounds like from this location. And that was a good education for the guys. It really was. It really is for... You, you noticed it mm -hmm. right away. All kinds of musicians do that. Oh, yeah. Now, especially it's, with the equipment available. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it, you'd be crazy not to do it now. You really... Um, what do you think about San Francisco Earthquake getting a second printing? How does that make you feel? Oh, I, I love it. <laughs> 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 I love it. Because, you know... When all of this happened, Mark got a hold of me because my webpage or my uh, Hotmail thing had gotten shut off because they were trying to make me go into uh, Outlook instead of Hotmail. Mm -hmm. And they shut me off for like a year and a half. Well, that was when the record company was trying to contact me. And when they couldn't get me, then they looked up Mark and got Mark, okay. And Mark called me and asked me, he says, well, what do you think of this? And I said, well, I think we ought to do it. I said... The fact is, is that it legitimizes everything we ever did. Now we can be a real band. We're official. Because we exist historically. How many years later are we official? Mm, 45. Still <laughs> official 45 years later. <laughs> but, you know, that doesn't really matter. Because I know from, you know, you're around music a lot. 
I know from studying the record sales business of what what is really expensive to buy. Mm -hmm. And 20 years from now, these recordings are going to be worth a lot of money. They are really <laughs> going to be worth a lot of money. And the reason is, is because there's not a lot of copies of them, and they have incredible critical reviews, which I'm going to try and permanently attach to it on the mm -hmm. website, okay? Because that's how you set up historical... Yeah. I mean, that's why I set up the Pendragon webpage. I was just hoping somebody would find it and say, well, God, I want to use that song, or, you know, mm -hmm. you never know what can happen out of it. But those guys were too good to just disappear in nothing. Do you think that these guys are better now than they were when they first started and when these recordings well, were Well, they're more experienced. Uh, and I think if they spent the time they did back then, they would, within a couple of months of daily practice, they would be playing the way they did back then. Now, that's not to say they're not exceptional right now, because they are. They've smoothed off a number of edges that only experience can give you. But back then, they were playing four to six hours every day. Mm. And... I think if you talk to any one of them, you'll find out when they started rehearsing for this, they had a hell of a time getting back to what they were producing then. I know Bruce was telling me, he says, you know, on certain songs, he says, it just blew me away that I ever played that. <laughs> you know? He says, I worked for hours and hours trying to reproduce it, and it didn't work. Like there's a there's a co-lead in, in the song Old Man, mm -hmm. which is Mean Genie Old Man. But there's a co-lead that Bruce and Mark play that almost sounds like one guitar player. And when you listen to it, only a musician would know how complex what they were doing was. But they took two completely different sounds and they wove them together mm -hmm. to make a single melodic movement. Well, that's not easy stuff to do, but whenever they play this stuff, they have to practice that stuff for hours because it, it's so complex, mm -hmm. and they're always worried about it because they're, they haven't been doing it every day like they used to. They used to be able to pick up the guitar and play that stuff just like that, and it was like, it was like a part of their permanent memory, if you know what I mean. Do you think that's something the band sees itself doing in the future? Gelling like that again, putting a little bit more well, time? Well, I'm in? hoping so. Uh, I'm in the process of trying to find out who books the casinos in our area. Mm -hmm. Because I know once you get into the casino circuit, you get into the whole circuit. And where's okay? your area? My area is Phoenix. Awesome. Okay, time. I've got about eight casinos within 60 miles of me. And they're all real big, and they're all constantly bringing in big names. And they're always uh, basically free admission concerts. Mm -hmm. But just in my little town of Maricopa, I've had Eric Burden, Foghat, oh, wow. a whole list of uh, Edgar Winter. Uh, and these are all free concerts. They're all to bring in audience. Others were the Tubes, Creedence Clearwater. These were all people just this last summer that were in our local area. Okay. Soon to be with your Pendragon? Well, I'm hoping so. <laughs> uh, because one of the ideas I had some, some time back when we started doing this was it would be perfect to put Pendragon and Bad Daddy together. Mm -hmm like a single show, but they're two separate groups doing their separate things. Mm-hmm. Okay, but two of the guys are the same in the one. And who's Bad Daddy? Bad Daddy is the group that Mark and uh, Bruce do right now, okay? Mm -hmm. So they have a separate um, drummer and bassist? Yeah. They have a separate drummer and bassist, okay? But I, I thought of it because I had written a show 
that I wanted to do a stage show which would use like 20 actors mm -hmm. that were all singers and musicians and it would be like a DJ talking about rock bands from the 60s and you would have these guys come out and do the Hollies or you know different groups and you just put the right musicians together for each group so no two groups will look the same on stage Mm -hmm. But you're using the same actors to do the whole thing. And so okay. that's how you want to pitch Bad Daddy. Well, I wanted to do the thing with the Bad Daddy and so because we could get two bands working. Okay, you got a common member of the, the two guys between the two bands. Mm -hmm. So it gives a, it gives somebody buying the package a good package. Yes. Okay, because you got this older sound and you got the newer sound, and you got the two guys that tie it all together, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're the guys that wrote most of the songs on both bands, you know? That's pretty much why I thought it would work, because they are... The sounds are different. If you listen to Bad Daddy, they're way more folk, country, with a little bit of blues in there. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is you still hear the same styling from Mark and Bruce that they've always had. Yes. And do you see Uther Pendragon coming out with a new album anytime soon in the next few years? Well, if we decide we're going to do something along that line, it's certainly possible. The fact is, when we did this search, we found there were 88 original songs oh, wow. that we had. Not all of them were as good at recording as these, but that doesn't mean we couldn't go back and dig them out and pull out the melodies and pull out the lyrics and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'm working on for it and, and could make an album is I'm, I'm, I'm working on finding somebody to produce the rock musical on the band and I'm looking for somebody to do the rock opera and if we can get either one of those to go and I'm not going after Broadway or, I'm going after a college repertory, or even a high school repertory if they're good, and get it on so that I can get a film of it and have a permanent record of it. But that could make an, that could make an album, a very good album. And so, yeah, I think the potentials are there. There might even be another album within the materials we got. I think so. Well, if you said you had 200 tapes, that's... Yeah. Quite a bit of music in there. So, you know, when they added that six, they just went in and found the first six they could find. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take them that long. So I know they could come up with more. Well, thank you. That was Craig Peterson, the band's manager, and the man with the plan.